This is Putting It Together, Words and Music and Musical Theater. I'm Heather Nathans. I teach classes in theater at the University of Maryland. Americans have always wanted music in their theater. Early on, people even added songs to plays that weren't written as musicals. What we're hearing now is The Indian Princess from 1808, and it's unusual because it was one of the first American musical theater pieces to deal with a distinctly American topic, and in this case, it's the founding of Jamestown and the story of Pocahontas. American musical theater came from a lot of different sources, European tragic opera and comic opera, but also from a native form that we call minstrelsy. And that's where white men dress up in blackface. They put burnt cork on their faces and they pretend to be African-American. And they perform variety shows with skits and jokes and songs. And some of the most popular songs in American history grew out of the minstrel show, Oh Susanna and Camp Town Races and Dixie. Oh, Dizzy, dear, now you're my wife. I mean to pass a happy life away, away, away in Dixieland. One of the things that we got from minstrelsy that we hear in musical theater even today is that kind of popular appeal of the music. It's really music for the people to sing and to enjoy. And minstrelsy turns up everywhere in America. It's even in things like Little House on the Prairie. Another form that grew out of minstrelsy is called vaudeville. Vaudeville is a kind of variety show that can be comprised of musical acts or skits or specialty performances. It does not have to have a unifying theme or story. But above all, in spite of all these other forms, musical theater really owes a debt to a form called operetta. Operetta is a really close relative of opera, and often shows are considered operettas because they're lighter in tone and plot than an opera where people are going to be unhappy and die at the end. And often operettas aren't sung through like an opera would be. Instead, they have dialogue, spoken dialogue, that's interspersed with songs. And in an operetta, songs are often separate from the plot. And what that means is that you could take the songs out of the story and not change the meaning of the story. In fact, with some operettas, you could switch the songs from play to play and probably not be able to tell the difference. But as the musical evolved, the songs became more and more tied to the story. As musical theater writing developed, songs and music became much more tied to the story, plot, character, or mood. Whereas in the past, the songs used to just be about entertainment, now they were about advancing the plot, telling the story, or telling the audience how to feel. Yankee Doodle came to London just to ride the ponies. I am the Yankee Doodle boy. So, for example, in this song that we're hearing, George M. Cohan does a great job of creating a song that expresses a very patriotic mood. The song is its own self-contained little story and character. That starts to change in the 1920s. Fish got a The 1920s musical Showboat is a really good example of a hybrid kind of musical. There are throwaway songs, kind of fluffy, silly, don't mean anything, but there are also songs like Can't Help Loving That Man. This song is supposedly only one that a person of African-American descent would know or sing, so the fact that the character of Julie sings it is very significant to the plot because we find out that she is passing as a white woman. And it's the revelation of her racial identity through this song that changes the course of the character's life. So here, the song is vital in showing character and in advancing the story. After Showboat, songs really start to move the story forward in American musicals. 
the subject matter starts to evolve as well. There do still continue to be a lot of silly little musicals out there post-Showboat, but Showboat really helps to bring in new ideas about the ways that music and lyrics and story can all work together. Can't help loving that man of mine. Finishing the heart How you have to finish the heart The song you're hearing now is called Finishing the Hat, and it's from the 1980s musical Sunday in the Park with George, written by Stephen Sondheim. Stephen Sondheim had an enormous impact on the development of musical theater. He really took the idea of the story being pushed along by the song and took it further than anyone had before. Stepping back to look at a face Leaves a little space in the way like a window. Finishing the Hat is about an artist's obsession with his work and about how nobody gets that. He talks about everything he's giving up so that he can be an artist. And he goes through this whole journey of saying, I won't have a normal life, I won't have love, and I won't have children in the space of this one song. Look, I made a hat Where there never was a hat Minutes. You're listening to Seasons of Love from the musical Rent, which came out in the 1990s. And by the 1990s, the musical theater form had become really wide open. Rent really revitalized musical theater and drew in new young audiences who thought that the old musicals had really gotten too stuffy for them to enjoy. And today, musical theater combines all of the elements that we've been talking about so far. This song from Rent is about big ideas. How do you make your life meaningful, especially in a world that's facing AIDS and homelessness and drug abuse and other crises? But it's also about small moments of connection, boy meets girl. Rent shows that artists have learned to combine plot, story, character, and entertainment, and that they draw on all the different kinds of musical theater that have come before. what a musical is, first we have to understand what it isn't. A musical is a play with music, but it's not an opera. It's not a cabaret show. There are specific elements that set musical theater apart and make it distinctive. The most basic is integration. And what that means is weaving story and songs and dance and character all together. To be a musical, a show has to have a number of specific elements. All I want is a room somewhere far away from the cold night air. What we're listening to is the 1950s musical My Fair Lady and the song Wouldn't It Be Loverly. And this is a perfect example of what's called an I want song. An I want song comes early on in the show, and it really explains the main character's primary motivation. So what you hear in this song is, all I want is a good place to sleep and lots of food to eat and to be comfortable. And that tells you where the character is going to go in the play and what she's going to go after. Why can't I feel my skin should crack and peel? I want the fire. What you've just heard is from the musical Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and it's the song Walk Through the Fire. And it's the lead character singing about how she's lost her passion for life, and that's what she really wants to get back. So sometimes an I Want song is about literally what I want. I want a room, I want a chair, and sometimes it's about bigger ideas. I have dreams, and I want to follow those too. Another important element of musicals is that people tend to break into song. Why do you break into song when you've just been talking? Well, you do it when your emotions are too big to be contained. Here's an example from the musical Carousel. What if, what if he is a girl? A girl? What would I do with her? What could I do for her? A bum with no money. You can have fun with a son, but you gotta be a father. 
to a girl. Another important element of musical theater is poetry. So imagine if you were the perfect conversationalist and everything that you said was dazzlingly clever and people just admired your genius. Well, you can't do that in everyday life and everyday speech, but you can do that in a song. For example, if you just tried poetry in dialogue, it would sound weird. For example, flying so high with some guy in the sky, it's my idea of nothing to do. It doesn't work. It sounds stupid. But if you sing it... Flying so high with some guy One of the other things that makes musicals special is not just the lyrics, though. It's the way that the music heightens the mood. And when the music is done well, it can leave you feeling joyful. It could leave you feeling scared. It can leave you feeling off balance. This is the opening number from the 1980s musical Sweeney Todd by Stephen Sondheim, and it's about a barber who slashes people's throats and bakes them into pies. Attend the tale of Sweeney Todd. Attend the tale of Sweeney Todd. He served a duck and a vengeful god. He served a duck and a vengeful god. The next song we're going to hear is called Another Hundred People, and it's from Stephen Sondheim's musical called Company. Listen to the song and the way in which the music really just pushes you along and leaves you feeling breathless. When a musical is done correctly, you know what you should be feeling just from the music, even if you don't hear the words. Did you get my message? Because I looked in vain. Can we see each other Tuesday if it doesn't rain? Who will call you in the morning or my service will explode? And another hundred people just got off of the train. And another hundred people just got off of the train. And another hundred people just got off of the train. Another hundred people just got off of the train. American theater has a long tradition of using musical theater to comment on politics and society. And it's actually a tradition that goes back a lot longer than you think it would. It goes all the way back to the colonial period when we used comic opera, which was a really popular form in the early days of American theater. you're listening to is a British musical theater piece from the early 1700s called The Beggar's Opera. And The Beggar's Opera is a satire, and it's also a form that's known as ballad opera, which means it takes familiar tunes and puts in different words, and it uses those to talk about social issues and politics and maybe big scandals that are going on in the time period. And this is actually a tradition of musicals making comments on political and social events that continued when forms like The Beggar's Opera turn into actual musicals that we think about today. Tell me he's lazy, tell me he's slow, tell me I'm crazy, maybe I know, can't help loving that man of mine. The song we're hearing now is Can't Help Loving That Man from the 1920s musical Showboat. And... The play is about a group of traveling performers sailing down the Mississippi, and it contains all the different classes and races that you would have found in 19th century America. And Showboat talks about issues like interracial marriage, and it was something that was illegal not only when the play was set back in the 19th century, but also when the play was written. The song that you're hearing is significant because supposedly... This is a song that only African-Americans would have known or sung. This is not a white lady song. 
So it is the first clue that the audience gets that the character of Julie is biracial. Can't help loving that man listening to now is from the 1930s musical Cradle Will Rock and this is a musical about labor unrest and it was incredibly controversial when it first came out the government even tried to shut down the musical they were actually afraid of its power and what it would do there were a lot of other musicals that started to come out during the 1930s that dealt with social and political issues and while that may seem sort of distant and far away from us you should remember that Musicals were an incredibly popular form in the mid-20th century. Hit songs came out of the musicals. They were on the radio all the time. People bought the sheet music and played it in their homes. And people knew the big musical theater stars. I mean, it's something like American Idol is today, where people talk about the personalities, what they're singing, what they're doing, and their performances. And a lot of people who wrote musicals used the popularity of the form to raise social issues. So, for example, the song You've Got to Be Carefully Taught from the 1940s musical South Pacific is about racism. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got the trend continued through the 1950s. The musical West Side Story dealt with gang violence, it dealt with Puerto Rican immigration, and it also dealt, really for the first time, with juvenile delinquency. Dear kindly judge your honor, my parents treat me rough with all the marijuana. They won't give me a puff, they didn't want to have me, but somehow I was had. Leaping lizards, that's why I'm so bad. Right. As the issues changed, the musicals adapted. The 1990s musical Rent talks about the effects of drugs and homelessness and AIDS on American society. Too starving for attention, hating convention, hating pretension, not too many. Of course, hating dear old mom and dad. Today, in the 21st century, there's another trend. There's still a lot of social commentary in musicals, but it's not presented in a really serious way because that doesn't sell tickets. Me and you, I think everyone's a little bit racist sometimes. Doesn't mean we go around committing hate crimes. The song that you're hearing is Everyone's a Little Bit Racist from the musical Avenue Q. Avenue Q is a really interesting show because it's made to look like a kid's show, like Sesame Street, but it talks about really serious issues like racism and homophobia. And shows like Avenue Q really take us back to the Beggar's Opera because they take important social issues and put them in a very fun and humorous context to make the point. Because wouldn't you really rather laugh than be lectured to? Ethnic jokes might be uncouth, but you laugh because they're based on truth. Maybe we could live in harmony. Every time I look at you, I don't understand why you let things you did get so out of hand. in American musical theater stayed pretty much the same from about 1900 into the 1960s. They often followed pretty predictable rhyme schemes and they were backed by full orchestras. But in the 1960s, American society went through a huge number of changes with the civil rights movement and Vietnam, and American musicals started to change too. We're listening to the 1960s rock musical, Hair. And Hair was considered revolutionary when it first came out. It was really the first musical to use rock and roll in its score. And to bring rock in the theater was tremendously significant. For some people, it really revitalized the form. For others, it was a big violation of a form that they considered classic. They didn't want to see it. 
But after the rebellious 60s, people didn't know what to do with musicals anymore. American musical theater went through a little bit of a slump in the 70s and 80s, and we hit what was called the British Invasion. It got harder and harder to create American musicals in the 1970s and 80s. Shows like Cats and Phantom of the Opera were more about spectacle and less about storytelling. In Cats, there's really no story at all. It's just about different cats singing about their different abilities. In Phantom, there is a story, but what most people remember is the chandelier crashing to the floor or the mysterious trip through the Paris sewers. Musicals like this left a lot of people wondering, once you exhaust spectacle, what do you go to? Hearing is Circle of Life from the 1990s musical The Lion King. And in the 1990s and the early 2000s, you start to find people thinking about musical theater in new ways. For example, the Disney Corporation created a series of musicals for Broadway. And they hark back to the things that had worked in the past, so they focus on the connection of story, music, and character, and plot but they combine them with 21st century technology and spectacle and sensibility. So there really is something for everyone. They're taking things that look familiar, the old musical theater forms, and they're being very smart about how they reimagine them and update them. This song is Get Your Head in the Game from the 2006 High School Musical, which was one of the most successful Disney Channel original movies. It had a soundtrack that was the most commercially successful album of 2006. But what's most important is that all of a sudden, junior high school students and high school students started to come back to musical theater. And what's so interesting about High School Musical is that it is a throwback to the old form of the musical. Boy meets girl, songs that tell the story, let's put on a show. But it manages to make musical theater fun and cool because it uses hip hop and pop radio kinds of tunes, as well as all those old style forms. It made the musical popular in a way that it hasn't been in more than 30 years. But perhaps what's most important about High School Musical is that it has made musical theater something that you might actually be able to envision yourself in someday. listening, I'm Heather Nathans of the University of Maryland for Arts Edge, a program of the Education Department of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Hakuna Matata. What a wonderful phrase. It means no worries for the rest of your day. You already know a lot more about musical theater than you realize. If you watch movies, it's there in a place you've probably been visiting all your life. Hakuna Matata, what a wonderful phrase. Hakuna Matata, ain't no passing craze. The song we're listening to is Hakuna Matata from Disney's film version of The Lion King. If you've ever seen a Disney movie, that's the classic musical theater structure. Since Disney first started making cartoons, they've looked to Broadway and to musical theater. Think of Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, Little Mermaid, Pocahontas, Beauty and the Beast, and The Lion King. Every one of these gives you an example of what makes a successful musical. Each one of them has an I Want song. They all have a familiar plot structure, Boy Meets Girl or Boy Meets Fish, or a hero trying to find his way in the world. Each one balances comical musical numbers, like Hakuna Matata, with more serious musical numbers. They all use music to drive the story, and they all use music, dance, and plot, and they make them work together. I'm gonna be a mighty king, so enemies beware. Well, I've never 
never seen a king or beast with quite so little hair. I'm gonna be the main event. Like this is I Just Can't Wait to Be King from The Lion King, and it's an example of the classic I Want song. Simba is a young lion, he's the prince in his kingdom, and he knows that one day he'll be able to take over and rule. This is his I Want song about wishing that he could grow up faster. No one's saying do this. Now when I said that, no one's saying be there. What? No one's saying stop that. What? You don't no one's saying see here. Now see here. Another way that Disney movie musicals are like traditional Broadway musicals is in their structure. They contrast big comic numbers with smaller, quieter ones. This provides variety for the audience, but it also allows the creators to develop more complicated stories, characters, and kinds of music. I'll show you how it works. Let's take a classic Getting Broadway musical you. and compare it to a Disney cartoon. Getting to know you, getting to know all about you. Getting this is Getting to Know You from The King and I. In The King and I, a woman named Anna travels to Siam to teach the king's children. The king is a very intimidating man used to having his way, and he doesn't really know how to deal with Anna. In this song, Getting to Know You, Anna is trying to find her way in this strange world and to feel comfortable. But it's a fun song because she's making a game out of it. Getting to know you, getting to feel free and easy. When I'm with you, getting to know what to say. The next song you're going to hear is a comic song from Beauty and the Beast. And it tells the same story, except in this case, it's the dishes that are trying to get to know Belle and to help make her feel welcome in the castle. You're alone and you're scared, but the banquet's all prepared. No one's gloomy or complaining while the flatware is entertaining. The next two songs you're going to hear are also from The King and I and Beauty and the Beast. And these are both more dramatic songs that are being used to advance a different part of the plot and to reveal character. We've just been introduced. I do not know you well. But when the music started, something drew me to your side. So in the first song, Shall We Dance from The King and I, Anna and the King are all alone in a ballroom and are just starting to realize that they might be falling in love despite all the obstacles between them. They decide to dance together and it changes their whole relationship. And this song is about the question they're each asking themselves. Should I go further with this? Oh, perchance, when the last little star has left the sky, shall we still be together with our arms about each other? And shall you be my new romance? On the clear understanding that this kind of thing can happen, shall we dance, shall we dance, shall we dance? The next song, Something There, is also a more dramatic, serious song. And again, it's about two characters who are starting to realize that they may actually be falling in love. The song tells the audience that they're moving to the next stage in their relationship. There's something sweet and almost kind But he was mean and he was coarse and unrefined And now he's dear and so unsure I wonder why I didn't see it there before Here's another way that Broadway musicals and Disney cartoons overlap. Sometimes they even use the voice of Broadway stars. For instance, the voice of Ariel in The Little Mermaid is Jody Benson, who appeared in the Broadway musicals Crazy For You, Welcome to the Club, and Smile. Up where they walk, up where they run, up where they stay all day in the sun, wandering free, wish I could be part of that world. What would I give? There's an interesting twist on this story of Disney and musical theater. Snow White first came out when movies were the new technology. And Broadway moved west to Hollywood and into the cartoon and really helped to shape the Disney musical for the next 60 years. Then, in the 1990s, the tide started to push the other way. Disney moved to Broadway. And it came back and started to teach Broadway how to do the musical. Disney became the force that said, we figured out how to do it. We'll come back and remind you what classical musical theater structure was like. And they knew because they never stopped making it. When you wish upon a star, 
make no difference who you are Anything your heart desires will come to you A, D, 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 F sharp, A Will be the first notes of our show Okay, maybe you're wondering how you can become a famous musical theater artist. We'll start with the seed of an idea. It's important to remember that there's a difference between having a talent for music versus having a talent for musical theater. Then plant it onto paper with a Dixon Ticonderoga and then watch it sprout into a musical. And then we'll help to make it grow. When you're writing for musical theater, you have to keep your eye on plot, character, and action. And while classical composers like Beethoven might have argued that their music had all those qualities, they're working on a much more abstract level than what we think of when we see a musical like Guys and Dolls. We'll get together all our friends and exploit all of their talents. We'll explore the latest trends and avoid them when we balance the book with the score. Score with a lyric. Here are some tips for how you can become a musical theater artist. First, find a story that you love. Whether it's from a comic book, a short story, anime, pick your favorite story wherever it comes from and think about how you would tell it. Then, make yourself the boss of the story. In other words, put your own ideas into it. Next, think about what kind of music you like. And does that kind of music go with that story, or how could it? Let's say you wanted to do a musical based on anime. What kind of music goes with anime? Does this sound like anime? Why? What kind of music goes with Superman? Does this sound like Superman? Why? Once you've thought of your story, think about what you want to do with your story that's different, out of the ordinary. For example, in the case of a musical called Fiddler on the Roof, it started out as a series of short stories and a short play about a Jewish milkman named Tevya and his daughters who lived in Russia in the 1890s. Tevya's story had been told a number of different ways, but it had never been told as a musical until some musical theater artists named Joe Stein and Sheldon Harnick got together and decided they could take these ideas and bring them all together and make a show that talked about Jewish traditions and Jewish culture. Here's Sheldon Harnick. One of the big decisions that we made was to interlink the stories and to keep the daughters alive and have them wander throughout one another's stories. Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. Find me a find, catch me a catch. Night after night in the dark I'm alone, so find me a match of my own. Next tip. Write what speaks to you. Fiddler on the Roof, the musical, isn't just the story of Tevye and his daughters. It's the story of a whole culture, a whole society. Musical theater can do that by reaching out and connecting to an audience member or an artist's experience. In the case of Fiddler on the Roof, Joe Stein says... My parents came from the old country, and uh, substantially I knew most of the customs and the mores of that community from my parents. We came to this material because it intrigued us, and it intrigued us because we came from this kind of uh, background. None of us would have written about the Indians, although they have probably very fascinating stories about the Indians, but they're not in our blood. Tradition! 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 Once you found the story and the music that inspired you, you have to get the skills. For example, you can imagine building a rocket ship, but if you have no technical skills, it just stays imagined. One practical thing you need to do in order to get into musical theater is to see lots of musicals, so you know lots of stories and can learn lots of different ways of storytelling. 
If you can't go to plays, you can do what Stephen Schwartz did. He's the composer who wrote the music for Broadway plays Wicked and Godspell and for the Disney cartoon Pocahontas. And I used to go to the library and take out the scripts for musicals that I hadn't seen, and I would actually put them up at the piano when I was supposed to be practicing and look at the lyrics and write other tunes to them. What's around the river bend? Waiting just around the river bend. I look once more just around the river bend beyond the shore where the gulls fly free. Don't know what for. What I dream the day might send just around the river bend. Here are a few more tips. Listen to lots of different kinds of music, because not everyone in your musical will always sing the same way. One character might rap, but another might sound better doing a ballad or the blues. Think about what you can do at your school, dance classes, acting classes, music classes. And if you can, do what Stephen Schwartz did. Go to a good theater school, and while you're there, get involved. I was interested in the theater, but I didn't know anything about it. And I had had, at that point, a decent amount of musical training. When I was in high school, I used to go into the city on the weekend to Juilliard, to the music school there. So I felt fairly well-versed in music, but as I said, I knew I was interested in theater, and um, I learned that Carnegie Mellon had one of the better undergraduate theater schools and had four very, very valuable years there. One of the good things that happened there is that they had an extracurricular organization which presented an original student-written musical every year. And I kind of signed up the first year I was there and got to co-write the musical. And so I wound up writing the, the show all four years I was there and you know, came out of school having written from scratch for musicals, which was really valuable. The field of musical theater is wide open now and is always on the lookout for the next big thing. Musical theater has always been at its best when it's full of people who care about music and art and telling stories. You can learn what you need to as you go. The most important thing to do now is to get started. Oh, it's the opening song. It doesn't have a title. No. Thanks for listening. I'm Heather Nathans of the University of Maryland for Arts Edge, a program of the Education Department of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. And here's the first scene of our music.